Yo, good buddy, I am here. Cool, I'll be right out. All right. Yo. Does the camera look like it's pointed at you? <laughs> no. No? Should it go up or what? Uh, now it's now it's kind of like I'm right, right there. Okay, so I need to go over like that. You, you can just adjust it to whatever looks best. Okay, good. All right. Welcome. Yeah, give me a hug. Good to see you. Likewise. Rosa Langabeer, is that your uh, wife's name? Yeah, Rosie. Uh -huh. Rosa was a, was a brief experiment in renaming her. At the Mercury Cafe you played there recently. Wow. Oh, wow, it's been a, it's been, it's been a couple of years. Oh, well, 15. But uh, yeah. still, you were at the Mercury Cafe. Yeah, I haven't been back in, in many, many years. A remade contraption. That's phase five now, I think. It, using the same original... Um, yeah, uh, this, this cylinder bit here and this bit here. Um, I don't know whether I had changed that out. No, this is definitely new. Yeah, looking. no, it's gone through a lot of a lot of changes. Great! Look at all these gadgets and thingamahoozy wops. Yeah, now I've been in this place uh, <sighs> ooh, ten years now. Go ahead, press the button. No, not that this. button. This button here. Oh, okay. And let go. It's got to come on. Very nice. <laughs> I just read a book on uh, Tangli, who, of course, uh -huh. is one of my favorite. Um, Kinetic sculptors and another guy uh, whose name is escaping me at the moment, but whose work I also like, who's completely different from Tangy. Uh, Shop Nicholas Schaffler. You mm. know his stuff? I don't think I know. Not right off the bat. He's much more clean cut than Tangley is. Do you have any new recordings you want to trade? Because I have got a shitload of them. Um. No, although I am, I'm working on a, I'm working on a uh, double LP box set right now. Yeah, that's not done yet, though. Huh? It's, it's just, we're just, tr I'm trying to get the, no, I, I think we're going to release it in uh, June. <coughs> All right, well, I'll just give you uh, the CDs that I have with me, and we will presumably cross paths at some point or another in the future. Here's a, this is a, a compilation. Okay. This is a retrospective of a work of mine from 75 to 2015. This is a follow-up to that that's different work from roughly the same period. Uh-huh. Uh, and then this is the most recent release. There's one that's missing from all that. <coughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you keep it going, man. I currently play with a group that I'm calling The Ticket That Exploded, which is me and three other guys. You know, you've got a veritable machine shop here. Pretty much. Yeah, there's a couple couple tools that I don't have. So what's this stuff over here? So these are new, these are new Viber wheels. I'm trying to think whether I played Viber wheels with you at any time. Well, you have the, the spinning vibrators over the guitar pickup, which is yeah. what, yeah. what I think of. You've made yet another guitar. The former guitar, there's been a, there's, you know, that was one, that was one, those were in the aughts. Playing that one was former guitar, but they they developed. That one's the most elegant one yet that I remember. Except, for, well, the new guitar was very small, but that one looks even more elegant. Looks like you decided to make moving your amplifier a little easier. Although these days, <coughs> portable speakers are so efficient that uh, something like this is obsolete. Maybe it's got a good bass sound though. Well, I want to play rock music. <laughs> Although I've, I I keep forgetting that with that, um, I I think I've got a crack in the speaker and I never, you know, so here in the, in the studio it's just fine, but when I go out and I like crank it up all the way, it keeps uh -huh. running. So, so there's, and then there's these.
And of course, vibrators come very small these days too. There's ones I've seen that are about this big. Yeah. And they have. Hmm. They've got programs in them now. Do they really? <laughs> That's great. So when you do that, so then you can get, you know, it, it becomes a pretty, um, a pretty complicated rhythm machine. Yeah, nice. Yeah, okay. So that's, so these Viber wheels have, have probably had more iterations in them than, than any other. Uh, and then, you know, then with this, you can go stereo you can move this other, you can move your sort of duty cycle around. Oh yeah, that's nice. So that's about as elaborate as a, as a Viber wheel needs to be. But then I got sort of, kind of sort of a new noise group. So Who's that? What's the name of uh, that? Well, I'm, I'm, I've been playing with Rupert lately. Yeah, Rupert told me. Yeah. That's yeah, how, yeah. And that's a, that's a sweet thing. There's a, a band that we haven't even played out yet. We're playing next uh, in a week or so. Um, called Worm Eater, which is just me on on uh, former guitar and drums and a, and a you know jumping excited vocalist. Uh huh. Meaning Rupert? No, no. Oh. No, some ki some kid, um, some rapper. Uh huh. He's a Philly, this Philly kid. Really? He yeah. comes down from Philly? Yeah, they're gonna come down. I mean, I practiced with them up there, but they're uh -huh. coming down for a gig. Yeah, this shit turned out mad tight. Mm -hmm. That's dead ass though. Shout out to Philly. Shout out to my homie right here. Yo, yo, yo. Come on, come on, get it, guys. We want to interview. We want to yo, 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 yo. You know what I'm saying? We out here. Documentary shit. We out here. quite elaborate so mm -hmm. I just made this really simple one um, how'd you connect to this rapper um, so Khalil Ali and I go way back we've been in a really awesome punk hardcore project called Doom War years ago we got both of those albums on Spotify and Neil and I met through his amazing lovely wife and a collaborator that I know Named Rosie Langbeer. She's a yeah, uh, Rosie. Yeah, she's yeah, Rosie. amazing New Zealand. Yeah, Rosie. Rosie's the shit. So uh, that's the homegirl. And uh, Neil Neil guested on a Doom Horse set back in like 2015, and we were like, this works. So we've done this a couple times. Thanks for being here, guys. So this is the beautiful new efficient um, small package, you know, carry ball. <laughs> That's very efficient. Um, so this, this box, is that something you made or is that? Yeah. No, that's another thing of why it makes it easy to, you know, because a lot of these now I'm just I'm getting down to a design that's like, as little let's, as just possible. Get a, let's just get a design that, you know, that has everything that it needs. It doesn't have anything that's, you know, like this is sort of the elaborate mode. Mm -hmm. That's like, oh, this will, this will do. And it's parts that I can readily get and put together. So it's easier to modify. So that has an amplifier in it, a preamp, or what? No, it's just got a, it's got a guitar pickup. It's like a bass guitar. Oh, I see. But the knob is still a volume knob. It's just volume knob. And this is so that I can, so that I can plug in, uh, so I can plug in the guitar. Uh huh. Just straight to that. Mm -hmm. One channel goes, you know. So I really work with that much. What about this uh, this uh, hobby horse that you just showed me? Is that something that you've used somewhere? I see it's, it looks like it's got an upside down projector on it. Uh, uh, yeah. What what's the the purpose of the projector is to just make things spin around or what? Yeah, the purpose of the projector is to spin the spin the the um, the rewind uh -huh. reel 
with a weight in it just to make it bounce and up, up, up and down on the strings. Nice. It was actually intended as a sex machine. Uh huh. So like a, a flashlight will fit in where the where the green ball is, mm -hmm. and then that thing spins, and you know, so it's sort of like a dangerous and overcomplicated sex machine for the <laughs> sake of reality. And what's this thing for? Oh, this is uh, this is a thing that I did. It's a feature. It's had a few. This is like its third iteration. Um, but I did this uh, for kids. Is that the power source for that? So what's happening is is these contacts uh -huh. are are closing a circuit between these batteries and and then these speakers. So these are just speakers in there. Mm -hmm. I forget you worked for the Children's Museum. Is there a yeah. Children's Museum here? Yeah. Yeah. I've got shows coming up at the Children's Museum where, which I'm really You're excited about. The Pittsburgh about. Children's Museum. The yeah, Pittsburgh one. Yeah. They're um. They've built a three-story climbing thing that's ropes that are woven together like lace. And we'll be playing in that space, and the audience can climb around in the three stories of the ropes. That's coming up in April. I'm really excited about that. So basically, it started out with this thing. Uh-huh. And I thought the idea was... Um, the idea was to make electronic music from 1860. Mm -hmm. So I could use a battery and I could use an electromagnetic coil and and that's basically it. Mm -hmm. And then this sort of switching mechanism. So you I know some people date the um, the uh, telegraph as the first electronic instrument. So, so there is some precedent here for what you're doing in the sense of... Yeah, well, I think what it was is I got invented to do a Sonic Circuits. I did a Sonic Circuits um, festival, which is a festival they have in D.C. for electronic music. And I, and I took, I think, Viber wheels and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, oh, you know, like how to, how to make it so primitive, like how to make it without any semiconductors. So... Transporting this stuff must get to be pretty tricky these days. Yeah, so this is the only actually amplified one, and I guess I need to do batteries on this. And over the course of years, it's changed a lot. Um, there's, I did one, I did a big installation at Creative Alliance. That uh -huh. had, it was called A Journey Through the Cosmos, so it had all these like planet type things. <laughs> and then this was a spaceship kind of deal. And then if you look around, that exercise bicycle. I remember you was, doing something the next time. Was, uh, was I work? Was what I replaced that with just because this? Because um, it was you know unsupervised. Then last summer, Arlington Art Truck. Um, I got a commission from them. Arlington Art Truck. They've got this program where they take artists out with this big band, mm -hmm. and they go to like flea markets or farmers markets. Oh, cool. <laughs> you know, county fairs and blues festivals and stuff. And uh, so I made this so it could roll out of the van in five minutes and set up, and kids kids could play it. So it was actually it was actually kind of a it was actually kind of fun. They gave me money to to rebuild it, and then they also paid me, you know, on the job. There's another uh, former guitar I hadn't seen. Yeah, yeah, that one uh, that one was about 2007 or so. 
That was my, that was the one that I did for uh, motorcycle touring. Hmm. Because the, the other ones were, were another foot longer. So. Well, remember you did a motorcycle tour in 94 too, and then you had your new guitar. <laughs> The one that you call oh. your new guitar. Oh yeah. Which was also small, but I don't think it was yeah. as small as that. Yeah, it's gone through a couple couple there were some other these this is a gataint. So there were some <laughs> gataints that, that are a little a little more just a little longer than that. Do you have any instruments for sale? Yeah. What do you got? Because uh, I have some money for a change. Yeah, well, I have one of these. So these are. No, I would. I usually went 18 and 36. Oh, okay. And then that gives you an octave. <laughs> The difference is now in this right here. In the chair. Um, plug plug this in for you. So now this this can move up and down uh -huh. and adjust and adjust for different heights for setups here. <laughs> Without the rock. And the, <laughs> and the steady beat. Right. Without the roll. So yeah, there's a bunch of innovations that, you know. Well, that's nice. I like it. Sort of happens that. It looks, it reminds me of an old school robot design. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why this one is called the Bachelor. Uh-huh. What's that one called? Is that the Bachelor 2? Uh, well, this model, this specific one is called the Bachelor uh, for, for three different reasons. One was that um, it looks, it, the sort of the styling of it is very like 1970s back of National Lampoon and Playboy, you know, the tape deck days. Uh -huh. You know, it's got bachelor, 1970s bachelor styling. Yeah. Or uh, the bachelors of the bride stripped bare. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, and also I made that um, right after I got divorced. So. Ah, yes. So, here. All right, thanks. <laughs> Do you usually keep the uh, string that loose? I guess you do. Or is it just loose right now because it's not... Um... Uh, let's see. You can tighten it up. It's also this one hasn't been played quite so much. You can this. Also when you adjust this, it, it's sort of where its resting point is. What does the switch do? Uh, the switch is just like a regular guitar pickup. If, if you switch to the top, it's just the top pickup. Switch to below the reverse. Yeah, do we have any tooth on that? No, it doesn't seem to no. be. Here, hold this for a second. Okay. Let's plug in this other one. Mm -hmm. 
So this is the way that I have it set up is this one is just enough to be a fret and this one's a little bit lower. And then, but if you want to use that technique and get both the top and the bottom. Uh, So, I see that that one has more knobs and switches on it than the other one does. Uh, it does because this one goes stereo. Oh, nice. This one's a, so you can take these out two different channels. Mm -hmm. um, and it's got these pickups that I can't that I can't acquire anymore. Oh. What's so special about them? Well, but, but they were made by a company that they're a very innovative a design made by a company that went out of business uh -huh. in about two years. That's like the places where I give shows. They go under after about six yeah, months. Yeah, this was a guy who who was a guitar tech who had these amazing things where you could switch out and have different windings for each string, mm -hmm. and you could also move the pickups up and down the strings. Nice. Um, and you could switch them out just by snapping them in. So yeah, everything's pretty much adjustable. You can move this thing up and down. You can. You can change the distance between the strings. All right. I um. I will try this one. Your amp is throwing a hissy fit. Yeah. Do you have anything else for sale? Uh. Well, these vibra wheels are 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 coming together. Right now, I've got I've got to take three instruments to New Zealand. Hmm. So, like, I remade, I made a different one of these Wigglers. Have you ever seen this one? Uh-uh. Um, that looks nice, though. You're going to take this into New Zealand? No, what I did is I made a I made a slightly smaller one that was lighter, that would fit into an Uzi case, which you know was, <laughs> which would. Um, <laughs> the problem with it, it's just like no case could I put this in, and then could you throw it, and and it wouldn't break the case. Mm. Same with these Viber wheels, because these Viber wheels, these old chunkers here. <coughs> You know, because it depends on mass, I've, I've kind of kept that going. So this, and uh, and then I'm going to make a Nando when I'm down there. You're going to make and it in New Zealand? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's got pretty good staying power. Yeah. Well, that's that's part of it, too, is that's why you need the mass for, so all the, all the energy, you know, stays where... And what does that um, hypnospiral do? Oh, that's a um, that's a that's a sculpture. This is uh, set up. Uh -huh. So it's got a it's got a um, 1.5 RPM motor. So what happens is that this um, pulls this um, fruit basket the uh -huh. spring down and then releases it. And then this ball bounces around inside of it. Oh, okay. And then it comes down to a rest. <laughs> I particularly like the mirror. Yeah, that's nice. What do you call this one? The Hypno Vortex. Uh huh. Nice. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. I actually went and bought another one of those things so that I could do with them a little more, you know, home furnishing. Of it. Uh -huh. You carry your your uh, Nando bars in this golf bag, I see. This is sort of took off after that one, so it basically does the same thing and just and just sends nine volts out to a speaker. 
Uh-huh. Where's this button to? Just an interrupt button. Uh-huh. Or momentary on. And it's got its own internal speaker. It does, and then it can also go out. Are these all the same uh, thing, roughly? Roughly, they're all they're all different prototypes. What do you um, call these? These are magna booters. Magna booters. Pooters. Pooters. Uh -huh. You know, when I play this, I generally play with like um, a wah or at least an EQ. Uh -huh. get some type of tension for the thing. Yeah. But it's just a it's just a, uh, a reed switch, magnetic switch, like you have on your um, security system. Or that some have on their <laughs> security system. Yes, I don't have a security um, system. I must so it, admit. all it's doing is just, is, is just sending a pulse to, to whatever. Those sort things like, are held sort on like magnetically. It's like a hard drive, only, only um, exponentially more simple. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's got more than just two items there, so it's it's yeah, it's post digital. Oh, that's nice. So what's the difference with these other ones? Let's see, some of them have more switches, uh, etc. This one... That's, that switch is just if... That dial's just if you've got it plugged into an amplifier. So it's a volume switch then? Uh, it's, it's a volume switch. Mm -hmm. So you can take a line out or a speaker out, and you can go to the speaker. So Rosie's, uh, so these gonna, are going to go back on tour, like four of them. They, so in about two or three years ago, Rosie was writing a ballet in Philly. She, she's been working with. Uh, Does she ba live in Philly? X. She live in Philly? Philly? She's mo ma when she's working. She's mainly in Philly. Uh -huh. When she's in the states, she's probably there half the time. And so there's a this long, this full-length ballet that's kind of theatrical that is um, the, the sort of the background story of the ballet is the first airmail flight between the United States and New Zealand. Oh, interesting. 1939. Uh -huh. Okay, and so the aviator, Captain Music, was like a big hero and shit. So was that actually his name? Yeah, Music. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. In the USIK, uh -huh. and um, and so they did their flight to New Zealand through Kauai, you know, on these clipper ships, and then on the way back uh, in the South Pacific, the plane blew up. So that's sort of the story. It's very melodramatic. There's a lot yeah. of crying and a lot. Of, does does she do? Does Rosie do the choreography, or is she working with a no, dancer? She, does, she wrote the music for it. Oh, just yeah. Okay. So she wrote the music for it. But there's four airplane scenes where the where the dancers all kind of form these airplanes, uh -huh. and so they use the anaplum and four or five of these um, uh, magnifiers uh -huh. to do the music of the airplane. She plays keyboard too, or what? She uh, piano is her primary instrument, but she uh -huh. plays a lot of different, you know. So, and I had just invented these things. Yeah like when the production started so all of a it's sudden perfect time i just made two yeah but 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 i so it ran for like another two years but the first year i was like constantly like troubleshooting and switching these out and yeah you yeah know. and i don't know when you build instruments they always behave when you know you know just exactly how to touch them to get them to work and then uh, i just i built a um a hurdy-gurdy from a kit recently doesn't work very well at all but it looks really great uh -huh. and uh and at home i, I put a, a contact mic on it which is not really the best thing to use but it was what i had around or whatever and wh what i knew what to do with and i and i got it working fine and then i went to do a show at the library recently where they had a small exhibit of scores and cds and books of mine so i was you know excited to do this tie-in and out of two other people in the group 
and I couldn't get it to work at all. I mean, it wasn't that important because it was just one thing that I was going to use for one little piece and it really didn't matter at all, so I was like, fuck it. But it's a classic example of what you're talking about where I spent all this time at work, I mean at home, perfecting it, making it so that it's exactly the way I want it to be, and then just yeah. by moving it, forget it. Yeah, yeah. I did a whole series that the Anonymous Family Reunion was a part of. which were site-specific volunteers collectives. Right. I didn't even know whether you lived in, uh, uh, in Baltimore anymore. I, I thought you might live in New Zealand by now. Well, I'd like to, like to end up there. Yeah. But it's, it's a hard... It's Do you know Ernie Althoff? Do you know Ernie Althoff's work? Yeah. Hello, my name's Ernie Althoff. I'm a Melbourne composer, stroke artist, stroke composer, performer, sculptor, what have you. And um, I've been doing this kind of thing, timbral investigations, compositions, investigations of complex, complex context. How's that, eh? Um, here, we, here we have um, the first machine to be built in quite a while of um, the Heliosonics Ensemble. Um, this is one of the machines that makes a constant sound. There are two groups of machines. There's the constant and the sporadic. And uh, this is... This is... Ah! Yes, and this is one of the constants. Uh, I guess we can all see a boat in there, but to me it's also uh, a little stage set with a, a performer and the sort of large percussion instrument in, in front of it. Yes, you can see how responsive to uh, sunlight the thing is. You should, you should go to Melbourne just for the sake of playing with Ernie. Oh, you that's, that's a whole different. That's a whole different. Yeah, I know. I mean, obviously, I've been to Australia, but, uh, and, you know, obviously they're quite a distance away from each other, but since you're over in that neck of the woods, you might as well hop over there. You'd really like Ernie a lot. Uh -huh. And he, his, um, he makes things that kind of remind me of these, but they're often solar powered or they're, they're yeah, very. It's a solar thing. Yeah, I got, I got a, uh, you gave me a CD of it. Did I really? Oh, cool. Yeah, that's a great CD, I think. Yeah. Heliosonics, maybe. Yeah, Heliosonics. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's he's really really great. I don't. I hope he's still alive. He, he might not be, but um, I think you two would get along yeah. with each other a lot. I think you'd really enjoy playing with each other. Very nice guy too. You don't still have the roof, do you? Remember the roof? No, no, I don't. Yeah, my endeavor into into scales. Yeah, that that dragonfly looking thing up there. Yeah, I was wondering about that. That was um. Uh, that was when my dad passed. That was all his like dresser, you know, going through his stuff. Is like dresser drawer and memento. I'm gonna take the jewelry and do something with it. Yeah, and so that was sort of um, so the the circle in back is wasn't his, but everything else was like his stuff, and you know stuff that he kept his many mementos. So, so yeah. yeah, it was really nice to, to you know to do that, you know. And there's a lot of I mean. You know, the axe, there's a lot of severing tools. Up there. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to take the jewelry and make a, a portrait of a compulsive consumer a la Archimboldo. Yeah. Very big because there's so much jewelry, I'd have to make it big. Like yeah. as big as, you know, whatever, four by eight or yeah. something. Do you know, like do you know who Marie Mencken tell. is? Huh? Do you know who Marie Mencken was? No. She was a filmmaker who made diary films, and she was in some Warhol films, and she was uh -huh. married to, I think it was Willard Moss, but I might be misremembering, who was another filmmaker. Both of them were kind of underground filmmakers. Uh, Marie Mencken died, and, and then Willard Moss drank himself to dead, death and was dead three days later, I think, something like that. Uh -huh. You know, it was one of those, like, I'm not going to be around here without Marie around here, and that was it. He, yeah. he, he essentially killed himself but just by drinking himself to death, as I understand it. People my age, which is not necessarily the people that I hang out with, but there's people that I've known all my life. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everybody's parents are going, and, you know, and it's like, oh, this part of the process, you know. 
we, one of the reasons why I'm shooting footage today is because when I turn 60, I'm 66 now. So when I, I turn 60, you're going you're to come out of the time machine. Well, no, what happened is when I did turn 60, I said to my few friends who were in their 60s, because most of my friends are 20 or 30 years younger than me, I said, let's start a club called the 60 and Over Club. And we'll say it's a really exclusive club because you have to wait 60 years before you're allowed to join it. Now, I thought that was really funny. But none of my friends who were in their 60s wanted to admit that they were in their 60s. So I was the only member of the club because everybody else was in denial. You know, They couldn't admit that they were in their 60s because then people would start looking at them differently and realizing that they were maybe more decrepit than they actually appeared to be or whatever, right? So today, uh, after I visit you, I'm going down to Doug Retzer's place, which you're welcome to join me for if you like, because he's having a retrospective of 40 years worth of work in his house, and he's yeah. invited a lot of people over. Uh, so I'll probably see a lot of people that I haven't seen for a long time. So I was thinking of making a movie, which this will be footage of if I end up liking the footage. It's called Ov Old Folks at Home, uh, Two Meetings of the 60 and Over Club, you know, which is basically a bunch of old fogies sitting around and talking, etc., like you and I have been doing, except, of course, these are the interesting old fogies instead of the boring old fogies. Yeah. So... Um, Therefore, you are being typecast as over 60. As over what, what, are, what are you, about 64? Um, I'll be 64 in six weeks. Yeah, I, I thought I had you approximately yeah. nailed. Yeah, I know you were a little bit younger than me. It's, it's good to know a few other people in their yeah. 60s. Yeah, yeah, there's a guy There's a guy who came up to me, a panhandler. And I was down there. I was down there, I parked at the... Rite Aid parking lot down there, Martin Luther King, and you know, parking cathedral, that whole intersection. Anyway, it was down there, and a guy came up to me, and he was like, like I, I like you, you know, I really want, I want to be like you. And I said, well, what do you mean, be like you? He said, well, you look so good for your age. Uh, did he think? Did <laughs> well, he said, no, you didn't know me, you know, yeah. you didn't know. And I said, really, I'm 28, man. How did he and react like, to that? Oh. <laughs> well, can you help me out? You know, and I was like, <laughs> but yeah, it was sort of like, you look good for your age. It's like, what? Wait, how do you even know what that is? Yeah. Well, I, and, you uh, know, the 20, the 20 kids, the, you know, the younger people, you tell them your age and, and they're just like, you look so great, you know, because they don't know that people actually live. You know, to be older well, than that, you know. I, I gave a reading as a part of a 10 minute play fest at a bar that's not too far from where I live. Uh -huh. And I was, it wasn't really a reading, it was just me uh, talking about stories from a particular era of my life, which was in the 70s. I was going to use a timer, but uh, nobody else seems to be paying that much attention to such things, so I think I'll skip it. I'm tentatively a convenience. Yes. I'm going to tell five stories, if I can squeeze them in quickly enough, about living in a warehouse in Baltimore from uh, August of 1977 to January of 1978. Mm -hmm. And uh, afterwards, this young woman came up to me and she said, oh, she said, I've never heard anybody talk about the 70s before. I was like, it really wasn't that long ago, you know, but she acted like it was like, you know, were there dinosaurs back then? Or, you know, yeah. is that, was that like when the pterodactyls were? Or did you meet Jesus in person? Or, you know, whatever. It was like, but, but it, was, it was so bizarre to me that she thought of the 70s being uh, so, so, yeah. I mean, the woman must have been in her 30s. So, you know, maybe she was born in the... 80s or 90s at the latest, probably the 80s. Anyway, that was quite strange to me. But, and then as far as buying an instrument from you, I am tempted by that, but I think I'm going to pass because I don't think I would use it enough to justify getting it. Uh, and besides, I, I, I must admit, I I like the one with more knobs, etc., and the stereo thing more than I like the one that's mono. Uh huh. Um, but it is it is tempting. These are also tempting, but I think I'll pass. I was I had the roof in mind because as you probably don't remember, but 
I had thought about buying the roof from you a long time ago uh -huh. when I was going to Berlin, and then I didn't do it, probably partially because it would have been ridiculous to try to transport the thing because, you know, it had the stand that it was welded yeah. as a part of, and it would have been, would it, would have, it would have had to have been yeah. modified to get it over there. I ended up carrying my keyboard and stuff yeah. instead. No, it wasn't the most practical. No, but I liked it. You know, I, I did like it, partially just because of the name, the roof. I always thought that was funny, but uh, also because it had multiple strings, and I'm big on multiple string instruments. Someday I will get another instrument from you, I think. Yeah. Um, no, I think a magnifier is kind of your, your speed, actually. Well, I don't know. Uh, but not if you're, I guess not if you're doing, yeah, maybe not. I mean, these days I tend to do fairly elaborate things. So the gear that I already have is what's really perfect for me. Uh, samplers yeah. are, are definitely really good for me, and that's what I use as a, a sampler where I can assign a different key to every, mm -hmm. um, I mean, a, a different sound to every key. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, I like the, um, the, the latest guitar. It's, it's great to see you, and it's great to see yeah, what you're up likewise. to. Uh, yeah, nice. And, you know, we really should play together in New Zealand, that would be super fun. Yeah. I, I, if I don't blow through all this money incredibly quickly, yeah, which no, I won't. Yeah, New Zealand's awesome. No, I'm yeah. going there, I'm going there in a couple of weeks, so. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of itching, I've been down there enough, and it's like, oh, yeah, I should be. You know, just world such as it is up here, it's like, it's not, I mean, it's not candy land down there, but, you know, people are nicer in future. I, m I made a, uh, I, I installed an exhibit called Whales Tahura at the Natural History Museum in Pittsburgh, and that uh -huh. came from New Zealand. It came from Te Papa, which is the Natural History Museum in whatever the big city is in New Zealand. There's Wellington, but I, I can't remember. Auckland. It might have been Auckland. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. But the guys who came were all Maori guys, and yeah. they were nice. And one of them in particular came and did a ceremony before we could start working on the, on the thing which I thought was kind of cool, even though I'm anti-religious. And then he and I got to be friends, and he made Maori instruments. Uh -huh. uh, so I had him come over to my house, and we made a movie called Avicenna's Floating Maori, where he demonstrated the instruments, and then there was him playing with a group of friends of mine. Uh, kia ora koutou, I'm called Shane Tukuingo. My name is Shane, and I'm from New Zealand, Aotearoa, uh, land of the long white cloud. And I've got some traditional tonga pūro, which are Māori wind instruments. Um, I've, I've manufactured or made a lot of these, carved a lot of these instruments. The first one we have here is um, called a putātara, um, which is a conch, a sea conch, with the added on uh, carving. This is related to Tangaroa, god of the sea, and also this one represents um, Tane, god of the forest. So it represents the union of two of their children that fell in love and so there you have that connection between the forest and the sea. And then we put it online and the funny thing is, is that it got to be, it got some attention because it was one of the only movies online about Maori instruments. Mm -hmm. And then he, he didn't come back for the teardown of the exhibit, and, I, and there was supposed to be a ceremony to accompany the teardown. So I talked to the other guys. I said, well, who's going to do this ceremony? Because Shane's not here. And they said, well, he told us that you should do the ceremony. Uh -huh. I was like, I can't do that. You know, I mean, th and there was no way I could do it. But, but I was touched because at the same time it showed that he actually thought that I was getting the Mari thing enough so that I could actually do it, even though there was no fucking way I could do yeah. it. I mean, it, it was just ridiculous. Yeah. But I was still touched that he, f you know, yeah. that he felt that positive toward me. Yeah, yeah, Mari's a pretty cool. One of the coolest things I've been to in memory is uh, Mari uh, Cultural Festival. Um, that they have once a year, and they have all the different um, uh, I think what they call a marais. Uh -huh. All the different marais come together and they do the haka, sort of the most common, uh, most common form, but they have all these other forms and they compete against each other. But, you know, it's such a warrior 
I mean, it's just so fucking fierce. Yeah. Um, you know, just to see these. I, I was in tears. Yeah. It's like, holy shit, you know, this stuff is just so real and it's so rhythmic and so percussive and there's no drums. Yeah. It's all, you know, like stomping on the stage or, or you know, or whatever. Uh -huh. that, no, that's, a, that's an amazing culture about it. So. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, of course, it partially interests me as a place where there were flightless birds and no predators for the flightless birds. Uh, hence kiwis, of course. Yeah. Totally. And, and uh, you know, I always thought that was pretty interesting. There's all these stories about, of course, Europeans coming and there's a famous story about one guy having a cat that then is credited with having wiped out an entire species of birds because the birds were defenseless against this cat, which is probably an exaggerated story. Hello. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think it was just one, it was just one cat. But the cat well, I know, but that's, that's yeah. the way one of the stories is told. Yeah. It's the, that's the sort of the legend aspect of the story. Uh, but, and then, you know, there, there are contradictions to that legend that it was not Seemingly really at like least, that at least two cats just or whatever like. but uh I, you know I, I spent three months in australia i don't know whether you know that or not but i got to know australia fairly well i made a whole eight hour 24 minute 43 second movie about australia which i like a lot called uh, don't walk backwards and uh one of the most amazing things about australia is that in the outback there are so many flies that it's just insufferable. I mean, you can literally go like this and you'll kill a fly every time. You know, that's how many of them there are. And they'll land on your eyes and drink from your eyes, which gives the aboriginals uh, eye infections. And because the aboriginals have been, to a certain extent, forced into the outback away from the nicer areas where the, which the Europeans took over. Uh, and the reason why there are so many flies is because the Europeans brought hoofed animals. They brought cows and sheep in particular, and the cows and sheep shat everywhere, and then flies grew off of the shit. So uh, Australia is the archetype of ecological change wrought by human stupidity, because then they had the cane toad. Do yeah. you know much about the cane toad? Yeah. And they also had the rabbits, you know, about the rabbits. They had ended up having to divide the entire country with a rabbit-proof fence to prevent the rabbits from taking yeah. over the entire country. A similar thing happened in New Zealand, but it didn't happen as bad in New Zealand. Like the, the pollution from sheep and cattle happened, but it didn't happen to the extreme that it happened, at least in my understanding, in Australia. Well, so far, I mean, I, I don't know too much about it, but that's definitely happened. Yeah. And they bring, you know, it wasn't just the house cats. It's like, yeah, the English guys brought stoats and weevil, you know, and game. Yeah. So that they could, so that they could hunt. Yeah. And and yeah, wiped out all the all the English birds except except for a few kiwis, which are still, um, you know, not easy to find. Ah, uh, well, they've adapted by yeah. di by disappearing. Well, I mean, they're they, I mean that's their their hidden animals. I mean, they're, yeah. They're not yeah, I, I went out and uh, I got to spend some time on a TV refuge, and that was cool. You know, I got a collar at night, and, uh -huh. you know, and bang around in the in the stuff like that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, there's some still in there, but they're not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are those in New Zealand who want to just get rid of you know, kill all the cats. Thank you so for your that patience. Comes out there. This. Now this is the original Melocycle as... This is the original Melocycle. This wheel is original. This section here is like all this, the center piece uh -huh. is sexual. So how does this go? Oh, now I remember. So, okay, this, this piece comes off. What is this, neopyrene or something? It's UHMW. Yeah. 
Nice. So the purpose of having this on there is just to keep uh, it from keeping keep that sharp edge from busting through the case. Okay. Good. Okay, so Actually, I love the mad scientist aspect of all this. Uh, so, this piece goes, oh, goes to there. Okay, well, that's easy enough. And that's the pickup, obviously. It's one of the, one of the pickups. Okay, so you're screwing it in by holding it still while you spin the, yeah. the mechanism. Yeah. All right. Then you tighten it with a crescent wrench. So the, the pitch of the motors is determined by this switch, no, which is term, determined by this switch, which I believe it's lower speed on the, on when you flip to the right and full, uh, full power of whatever battery you have in there. But the battery will, the, the charge on the battery will determine the pitch of the speed of the motor and therefore the pitch of the, of the note as it goes by. Um, I don't think you're going to get uh, going fast enough where you're going to have like centrifugal force, <laughs> um, <laughs> which happens on the Viper wheels. Oh really? Yeah. I'm not going to take off or anything? Uh, no. Yeah. Alright, yeah. well then, uh, do you want to take it apart for me and put it in the case yeah. while I video so that I have a documentation of yeah. how it works? Sure. Let's, um, yeah, where's the, where's the case? Uh, don't worry about my coat. Okay, so this is just for the um, mixer, if you want to put that on there. Um, oh yeah, and I replaced the 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 top jack here, mm -hmm. which controls this pickup here. Okay. Okay. Let me get the sound with this thing. This is adjustable in terms of how everything is adjustable. On it. So anyway, we'll just talk with the. Um, so let's see. Probably the best thing to do is to take the wheels off first. Yeah, I noticed that. L and R. Too tight. Just immediately took for granted to for left and right, even though they could stand for lowland and rigor mortis. Yeah. 
In fact, they span for statistically 126th of everything in the universe. <laughs> okay, so you got that off. Uh, yeah, then I guess the next thing to do is to uh, just loosen that up, just like down there and then you take this crescent wrench and undo that bolt. Alright. Well, that looks like a pipe fitting there. A pipe yeah, it's corner. a speed rail clamp. that up. All right, it is disassembled. So, You want to get the, the, the pedals. pedals oriented like that. Uh -huh. And hmm. Looks to me like it's flipped around. Yeah. Nice and neat. That's how it fits. Um, oh, what you do first, though, is put that in there like that. And pull the padding under there. There we go. This goes on there. <coughs> um, like I said, I believe I think that this could really do with a little better padding. Yeah. Well, uh, that's no problem. I, would, I, can do I that. definitely advise that. Um, and then that way, I think that's what that's how the switches got broken. Uh huh. So you want to protect those. Um, and then that goes in there like that. Your toolkit. All right. I'm glad it comes with that. And I believe. Oh, you left something out there, didn't you? Oh, pedals. Pedals and this. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's what happens when you only. You don't do this for a year. So, uh, again, try and keep the pedals away from from delicate the switches. things. Switches. Right. Here, let's put another piece of foam in there. I, I think what I'll probably do is photograph it in different stages of being put in there, and then I'll put the photographs on the inside lid here so that I yeah. have something to consult. Cool. You know, the well, way we do, do you, it when do we you work wanna, in museums. Do you want to unpack this and set it up? No. Okay. I don't think I have any problem with it. I've, I'm a little bit preoccupied with yeah. uh, other things right now. Yeah, okay. I believe we have everything in there then. I think in this form, 
it, uh, I think it's probably about 49 and a half pounds. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it flying. No, I won't fly. Uh, unless you unless you just fill up the entire thing with foam. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't fly with it anyway. It's uh, I if, when I if I'm going to travel with an instrument, I'm going to travel with a keyboard and a sampler and yeah. other things that are more directly relevant to the way I usually play. This would be more for playing gigs in Pittsburgh or yeah, for touring in the in uh, in the uh, in a car or a van or whatever. Yeah, I don't remember whether I shot footage of the uh, Apex Rotozither in its current incarnation. Would you mind plugging that in for me again? No, not at all. That's the wildest stuff we've seen, man. What is that all about? What's with the, there's all this deal here with the, with the wheel, man. Is this driving? Well, this is made up of a uh, Apex mangle iron with just a chassis, a Daiwa shore fishing reel, a uh, film editing take up reel. No way. Some uh, lawnmower parts here. Whoa. Some more sewing machine parts here. A lamp part here. And we got a croquet ball, croquet, and a, and a, and a fishing rod, and a and a Pontiac uh, pre Ralph Nader Pontiac steering wheel here, because it's got this door knob on here. That's really interesting, man. What's it called? What is this called? What, what do you this? call it? This is called the Apex Roto Zither. Are you the and By the way, this is this is uh, impartially funded by the. Grant program by the Painted Bride Art Center in Philadelphia. I need to plug them because hey, they made hey. it. Okay, you're the inventor of this. You made this. And what's yeah. your name? My name's Neil Feather. Neil Feather. Okay. What happens if you change the location of all these guitar pickups? What has it change the sound? Well, this one. If I put the motor on for this, there shouldn't be anything happening. So that is your TV that's wrong. This goes like this. Let's see if you turn this up. Obviously, a musical instrument and a very original one. And this, does this go like, you know, is this better with other instruments or solo or what? You know. Uh, well, there's actually another instrument that it's designed after, which is called the contraption, which has 16 strings and hand cranks. And uh, I decided that when I made it 10 years, the contraption 10 years ago, that it was way too complicated. Yeah. And I would never do that again. So I don't. So blame I you, like man. to right. break promises to myself. So I decided to make one that was way more complicated. And this is here. The only thing left to do on this is to mount the extra sewing machine right here, which right. will have another pickup on that, so it'll have more motors and yeah, absolutely. Okay. Relationships do you ever tune it? I notice you got a lot of guitar tuning pegs on it. Yeah, you can tune it as it as it goes. It sounds like it's tuned, kind of, or is that just random? No, nothing's random about this. Okay. This is all with a purpose here. Yeah, I mean, well, it sounds kind of like it. I mean, it could be a random effect, or maybe you tuned it to be a specific. Well, type I, of I tuned it. I tuned it during uh, during its playing. So basically, it's it's uh, uh, you know it's planned to a certain extent, okay. but it's right. planned by ear. All these things, all my right. instruments are tuned by ear. Thank <laughs> you. 